Have we found another civilization? Is that a door to someone's home on another planet? Can we peek through the windows? After all, it was NASA's Curiosity rover that sent this image to Earth. And right now, this rover is exploring the surface of Mars. Unfortunately, astronomers were fast to disappoint us. They claimed that it was just a natural part of the Martian landscape. There are several clues that made them think it wasn't a real door. For example, it's tiny, a mere 3 feet high. But it might simply mean the Martians aren't that tall, you may object. But scientists keep insisting that what looks like a door is actually an opening in a rock created by natural forces, like winds and erosion. The thing is, if you look at the rock attentively, you may notice strata, the layers of silt that stand out because they're harder than the surrounding material. These strata dip here on the left and a bit higher on the right. They likely appeared around 4 billion years ago in a river or a wind-blown dune. Since the strata became visible, powerful Martian winds have eroded them even more. And now you can see that they disappear inside the door. And look at this! See those cracks? Yeah, those! That's how rocks weather on the red planet. This small cave probably formed when several fractures crossed the strata. A pretty large boulder might have fallen out under its own weight, and this created the door-shaped opening. Now, This theory is quite plausible, because even though the gravity on Mars isn't as strong as on Earth, it's still strong enough to do it. Besides, see that rock to the right of the opening? It has a suspiciously smooth vertical edge. It must be the culprit. It probably fell out not so long ago, and Martian winds haven't got rid of it yet. And winds on Mars can be exceptionally powerful. This planet is infamous for its intense dust storms. Sometimes they kick up so much dust that you can see it through a telescope on Earth. Such storms occur every year and cover continent-sized areas. They also last for weeks at a time. But besides these annual storms, there are even larger storms that happen much more rarely. But they're more powerful and way more intense. Those are called global dust storms because they encircle the entire planet. But even if you got caught in the most severe storm on Mars, it wouldn't be as terrible as you might think. The wind speed on the worst Martian storms reaches 60 miles an hour tops. Hurricane force winds on our planet can be twice that speed. You should also keep in mind that the atmosphere on the red planet is 1% as dense as the atmosphere on Earth. That's why, if you decided to fly a kite on Mars, you'd need the wind to be much faster than on Earth. Otherwise, you wouldn't even be able to get the kite in the air. In other words, even though it's quite windy on Mars, it doesn't feel as intense as on our home planet. Oh, by the way, you might have noticed I keep calling Mars the red planet. Why? Look, our neighbor is covered in dust, soil, and rock that is rich in iron oxide. That's what gives the surface of the planet its trademark red hue. And look, there's the trademark! Nah, just kidding. Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun. Not so far away from the star, you might say. And still, it's a cold and deserted world. The average temperature on its surface is minus 81 degrees Fahrenheit. But if you ever visit one of its poles during the wintertime, bring a lot of warm clothing. Because the temperatures are likely to drop to minus 220 degrees there. In the summer, though, you might feel very comfortable in some regions. There, the temperatures can rise to 70 degrees, not very different from what we're used to. Mars is one of the most explored space bodies in the solar system. At the moment, NASA has two rovers roaming the red landscapes, Curiosity and Perseverance. There's also one lander called InSight and Helicopter Ingenuity, nicknamed Ginny. Perseverance is the most advanced and largest rover ever sent to another world. The journey to the red planet took 203 days, and Ginny traveled to Mars attached to the belly of Perseverance. Sounds cozy. And now, I'm going to tell you something really curious. Let's say you're a Babylonian who lived around 5,000 years ago. Babylonia was an empire in ancient Mesopotamia. Just think back to 6th grade. Anyway, your neighbor comes up to you and says, what day is it today? And what do you answer? It's Mars Day! Wait, what? When the ancient Babylonians created the week, they decided to divide it into seven parts. Each day got named after some space body, like the Moon, the Sun, Venus, and so on. Mars Day was on Tuesday. The Babylonians believed that each of these space objects influenced their lives on the day named after it. 
And since Mars was red in color, they associated it with aggression. That's why on Tuesdays, they had special ceremonies to avoid the influence of the unfriendly planet. Indeed, Mars might seem unfriendly to a tired traveler. Its atmosphere is very thin. Its volume is a near 1% of the atmosphere on Earth. In other words, there's 99% less air to breathe on the red planet. Mars' atmosphere is mostly made up of carbon dioxide. At such high concentrations, it's toxic for us humans. And if you were looking for some oxygen to breathe on Mars, you'd come away empty-handed. There's only one-tenth of one percent of oxygen in the air on the red planet. That's definitely not enough for you to survive there. At the moment, Mars has two moons, Deimos and Phobos. Astronomers think they may be asteroids once caught in the gravitational field of the planet. The moons are shaped like potatoes. That's because their mass is too little for gravity to give them a spherical form. Potatoes, eh? Maybe they should be renamed Mashed and O'Groton. One day, Mars will get a ring of its own. It might happen in the next 20 to 40 million years. Will Brightside be there? Stay tuned. Mars's gravitational forces will tear apart the planet's largest moon, Phobos. Hey, it really will get mashed. Some chunks of the former moon will crash into Mars, and others will break apart and create the ring around the planet. This ring might exist for at least 100 million years. The surface of Mars is cut by a huge canyon system known as Vals Marineris. Mm, sounds like a pasta sauce. If it were on Earth, it'd stretch all the way from New York to California, over 3,000 miles. At its widest part, the largest canyon on Mars is 200 miles, and it reaches 4 miles at its deepest point. If you still have difficulties imagining the sheer size of this natural phenomenon, here you go. Vals Marineris is 10 times the size of the Grand Canyon on Earth. Now, since we're on the subject of gigantic things, let's talk about Olympus Mons. This is the largest volcano in the solar system, and it's on Mars too. It's three times as tall as Mount Everest on our planet, and that's the tallest mountain above sea level. And the base of Olympus Mons is as large as the state of New Mexico. Now, scientists think there could have been water on Mars in the past. What made them think so? They found lots of ancient river valley networks and lake beds on the surface of the red planet. Plus, on Mars, there are minerals and rocks that could only form in liquid water. Mars might even have experienced terrible floods 3.5 billion years ago. These days, there's still some water on the red planet, but Mars's atmosphere is too thin for this water to stay in its liquid form on the surface. Now, it only exists in the form of water ice. You can find it just under the surface of the planet in its polar regions. The only place where this water is visible is at the North Polar Ice Cap. Also, sometimes, salty water flows down crater walls and hillsides, and there are tiny quantities of water in the planet's atmosphere, but it only exists as vapor. So, as a vacation spot, I think I'll pass. Millions of people around the world go out on the streets and rooftops to look at the amazing cosmic phenomenon. Another planet right next to the moon, a big red one. At first, everyone's excited. Mars showing up out of nowhere is having a strange effect on humanity. Just as the moon can affect the psychological and physical state of some people, Mars's unexpected visit is causing people to behave pretty strangely. Every night, the sky is lit up by the white light of the moon and the red glow of Mars. Many people get a sort of instant insomnia. Some even stop drinking coffee because they no longer feel sleepy. Mars brings out energy and a little wildness in people, making them laugh more, and even drives a few poor people crazy. They begin to go out of their houses more often and enjoy the unusual night sky. A few days later, everybody can see what's happening. Mars is getting bigger. Scientists announced that the red planet is slowly moving towards Earth. A collision is inevitable. Earthlings only have a few years left. A few months ago, a huge asteroid crashed into the red planet with such force that Mars simply flew out of its own orbit and went rogue. The chance that Mars would fly close to Earth was always going to be pretty high. After about three seconds of being announced, the news went viral, and panic set in. The situation's getting worse and worse. The closer Mars gets, the more it affects people on a physical level. 
hundreds of videos pop up showing collision simulations of Mars and Earth. And there's no happy ending. Want to see what happens? One famous blogger asks her followers. The Earth's almost completely covered with water, and Mars is all dust, sand, and rocks. Then she puts a huge watermelon in the middle of her room. From the far end, she launches a bowling ball at it. Strike! Mars looks almost the same size as the Moon now. It's about to come into the Moon's orbit, and it's affecting the Earth's magnetic field. Floods, hurricanes, tsunamis, powerful thunderstorms. They go from bad to worse. Animals go crazy. Birds no longer migrate south. The polar northern lights appear in the Caribbean. The economy isn't handling the news that well. People stop showing up to work. Why wouldn't they? They just want to have fun and be with loved ones. There are enough resources on the planet to last until the catastrophe, so no one's even trying to fix the Earth's problems. Clothing, food, cars, yachts, whatever, everything loses its value and becomes free. Every day, huge street parties pop up all over the world. People decide to live their last months in peace and harmony. The global catastrophe is uniting humanity like never before. To go out with a bang, Earthlings team up to organize a huge rock concert. The red giant destroying our beautiful blue planet. Yeah, rock and roll's the perfect soundtrack. There's just enough time to eat, dance, party, and listen to good music. Huge stages are built all over the planet. It's every musician's last concert. During all that preparation, hope suddenly appears. Scientists have calculated all the events that'll occur when Mars crashes into Earth, and they have a simple plan. Luckily, humans had already planned on moving to Mars, so they already have been building spaceships for years. There's no time to get to another planet before the collision. But the good news is that people can wait out the disaster just outside Earth's orbit. You get to sit in a space station, munch some popcorn, relax, and enjoy the show. When the dust settles, it might just be possible to return to Earth, or what's left of it. After learning about this plan, people start working on finishing the ships night and day. Everyone in the world pitches in. There are still two years left before the big day. The huge concert stages are converted into more space stations. Mars is now giving people more energy, and with epic teamwork, people manage to create thousands of stations in just a few months. That's what happens when 7 billion people work together. Farmers, physical therapists, chefs, engineers, athletes, accountants, all on the same team. Mars is now closer to us than the Moon. The red giant blocks out the sun and our planet is plunged into darkness. There are only a few days left. People are working like ants in a massive colony, putting the finishing touches on several hundred thousand space stations. It takes four whole days for everyone to get on board. Plus, there's the loading of supplies. Animals, fish, seeds, plants, vegetables, fruits, video games, fruit roll-ups. The red giant is scheduled to enter Earth's orbit in a couple of days. That's when it will really pick up speed. Mars is only a little more than half the size of Earth. But up in the sky, it looks infinitely huge. The ships start taking off. People take a last look around, memorizing every inch. In a few hours, it'll all change forever. The stations fly up far enough away to clear any orbits. Two worlds colliding together should still have a soundtrack, though. Rock stars on every ship organize an outer space music festival. To the awesome sound of rock, Mars enters Earth's atmosphere and burns a thin layer of its own surface. This releases an incredible amount of energy. It gets faster and faster and smashes into the Pacific Ocean. A huge blast wave sweeps across the entire planet. Everything is lit up by flames, and everyone on the ships has to put on sunglasses to avoid being blinded. Our blue planet is turning into a fiery one. The dust of Mars mixes with the water of Earth. The force of the impact goes through the Earth's crust into the liquid-hot magma. Hundreds of pieces of Mars, some the size of entire countries, are somehow floating in the atmosphere. The collision generates so much energy that all oceans boil and evaporate. 
seas, and rivers of molten metal are now spreading all over Earth. Days, weeks, months pass. A belt made up of bits of Mars forms around the Earth. It's like a fiery version of Saturn. It'll take a long time before it's safe to land back down. But humanity can't stay alive on the ships all that time. Food, water, and oxygen will run out after a few years. But scientists already have a plan. The ships flip a switch and become huge cryo chambers. The ships are equipped with energy panels, and the roasting hot Earth's giving off a lot of energy. Totally enough to keep the ships working while everyone on board takes a few thousand year nap. As soon as the planet cools down, humans will wake up. Hundreds of thousands of years pass. One day, alarms go off simultaneously on all the ships. People wake up, slowly. Their bodies are exhausted, but after a few billion cups of coffee, everyone's ready to go. Down on Earth, new continents should have formed, and the atmosphere is most likely way different. The planet might have lost its original orbit, so it might be spinning at a different angle. The seasons as we know them, gone. All the water on Earth evaporated in the first few hours. But there were huge glaciers on Mars, which might have melted on impact. Mars may have shared its water with our planet. The clouds of dust and dirt should have settled by now, and the ground should be pretty good for growing stuff on. All that magma probably spewed up a bunch of useful minerals and chemicals. It's going to be difficult, but humanity somehow must adapt to the new Earth. People are ready for anything. All the Earthlings run to the nearest windows to see what their beloved planet looks like after all these centuries. Um, where is it? People are craning their necks, looking out at the empty spot where the Earth used to be. The impact of Mars was so strong that it pushed the Earth out of its orbit around the Sun. It's gone. Great. What are we gonna do now? Some bearded guy grabs a guitar and says, Let's play! The Grand Canyon in Arizona is bigger than the state of Rhode Island. You could even fit the whole of Manhattan in there. It's so massive, it kind of has its own weather. But the Grand Canyon isn't the only big crack out there. The Valles Marineris is bigger, way bigger. It's on Mars, and it goes nearly a quarter of the way round the planet. It's 10 times as long as the Grand Canyon, and it's so deep, you could parachute into it. The Kesai Valles is also on Mars. It's made up of a series of canyons, and it might be the ancient home of a massive Mars flood. There are huge canals and canyons all over the Red Planet. There's Tiu Valles. That's where researchers think there was an epic battle between ancient Martian water and boiling hot volcanic lava. Guess we know who won that one. Equally impressive is Ares Valles. It's the longest known drainage system around. It might be weird to think of Mars as having huge waterways, rivers, and floodplains. But in its early days, Mars might have had a warm and wet climate. Now it's just dried up canyons as far as the eye can see. The Ithaca Chasma looks like a giant scar on Saturn's moon Tethys. It's four times longer than the Grand Canyon, and about three times as deep. And it's billions of years old. No one's been kayaking there yet. We've only seen a photo of it, thanks to the spacecraft Voyager 1. Mercury's Great Valley makes the Grand Canyon look like a tiny pothole. NASA's Messenger spacecraft was the first to snap some photos of this massive formation. The valley's surrounded by two giant somethings, the Enterprise and Belgica, whatever that means. Pluto's largest moon, Charon, has a canyon named Argo Chasma, and it's huge. Even though Pluto's not called a planet anymore, it can still brag about its huge canyon. Even right here on Earth, the Grand Canyon has some serious rivals. Yarlung Tsangpo Canyon is the deepest canyon on Earth. It's in the Himalayas, in Tibet. Some people call it the Everest of Canyons, you could fit a 2,000-story building in it. The Indus River Gorge is big and gnarly. 
It's in Pakistan, and you could stack three football fields inside it. The Indus River, one of the largest rivers in Asia, passes through it, and it's even home to baleen whales and porpoises. The Colca Canyon in Peru is a short but insanely bumpy bus ride away from Machu Picchu. It's the massive home for the largest flying bird in the world, the Andean condor. It has a wingspan of 10 feet. In Nepal, where the Himalayas are, is the spectacular Kali Gandaki Gorge. No one knows exactly how far down it goes, but it's probably around five times as deep as the Grand Canyon. It's got it all. Crazy terrain, thin air, and it's in the middle of nowhere. So beware, only experienced hikers should dare go in. The Copper Canyon in northern Mexico is home to a world-famous group of people who run marathons, or even double marathons, just for fun. There are six canyons all joined together, and in its widest part are two of Mexico's tallest waterfalls. Copper Canyon also has one of the longest zip lines in the world, and one of the scariest train rides you'll ever take. Don't look down. Even in the US, there's a lesser known canyon that's deeper than the Grand Canyon. It's Hell's Canyon. And it's sort of on the border between Oregon and Idaho. It was carved out by the Snake River. Hell's Canyon is home to the Seven Devils mountain range. The King's Canyon is in the Yosemite National Park area. It's about one and a half times as deep as the Grand Canyon. Nearby is the second largest tree on Earth, General Grant. The largest canyon in Australia is the Caperty Canyon, and you can get paid to go there. Mm, sort of. A few lucky cyclists and campers over the years have found gemstones on the banks of the Caperty River. If you're lucky, you'll also see some 2,000-year-old rock art. The Tiger Leaping Gorge is right out of a fairy tale, but it's very real, very deep, and pretty scary. The legend says that a tiger was being chased, and it leapt over the river at the bottom of the gorge, with a little help from a perfectly placed rock right in the middle of the river. The Great Rift Valley is 15 times longer than the Grand Canyon. So what, that's like a trillion miles long? It goes through two continents and is home to about 30 lakes. It's even visible from outer space. So if you're ever floating out there in the cosmos, Keep an eye out for it. The Kota Hawasi Canyon is deep, very deep. It has extreme rafting, kayaking, and hiking. And apparently the mosquitoes are pretty extreme too. There's one canyon in Tibet that I'm pretty sure holds a world record. Try looking up the Polong Tsangpo Canyon. No images pop up. It's 2021, that's insane. What's down there? Yeah, probably just a river and stuff. Colombia's Chickamauga Canyon is pretty much as deep as the Grand Canyon. Extreme sports own this place. Zip lining, canoeing, paragliding. Heck, even their cable car is extreme. It's a 25 minute ride and it's steep. Under Greenland is the Greenland Grand Canyon and it goes for hundreds and hundreds of miles. Water from melting icebergs runs through the canyon. It was actually NASA who discovered it. There's an absolutely massive canyon in Antarctica. The only problem, you can't see it. But apparently, it's freezing cold and mostly white. The sea has some mighty canyons too. The Zemchuk Canyon is one of the biggest underwater canyons. It's right off the coast of Alaska, and it's home to seals, dolphins, and whales. The deepest underwater canyon is about six times as deep as the Grand Canyon. It's the famous Mariana Trench. Make it to the bottom and you'll break the world record for deepest dive ever. The Grand Bahama Canyon is another underwater marvel. You could just keep dropping Empire State Buildings in there and you'd never see them on the surface. Monterey Bay is pretty laid back, but its canyon is anything but. There's lanternfish, squid, sea turtles, rockfish, and sea otters all hanging out together. Oh, and thousands of jellyfish, so take care not to get stung too much. There's also giant kelp around there, a seaweed that can grow up to 100 feet long. 
The Hudson Canyon runs from the New York Harbor right into the sea, and it's gross. Sure, it has deep sea coral and sponge formations, but it also has a whole bunch of trash and sewagey sludge coating the bottom. The Aviles Canyon is off the coast of Spain. It's one of the deepest underwater canyons in the world, and it's one of the few places where giant squid live. It's famous for its white coral and the fact that it's insanely cold. Bremer Canyon in Australia is underwater, massive, and dangerous, especially if you're a giant squid. That's the favorite snack of the local orca, the huge whale with a monster appetite. Bremer Canyon's a major tourist destination these days, especially for those looking to snap a pic of the more than 100 orcas that call it home. The Nazare Canyon is near Portugal. It's the largest submarine canyon in Europe, and it's around three miles deep. That's six of the world's tallest buildings. It forms high breaking waves, so it's become a haven for big wave surfers. The Canadian Arctic Rift System is huge. It goes all the way from the Labrador Sea to the Arctic Archipelago, and it connects the Arctic and Atlantic Oceans. So picture this. Greenland used to be smashed up against Canada some millions of years ago. Thanks to this rift system, Greenland's been slowly drifting away. Think how huge Canada would be if you added Greenland onto it. <laughs>